Podcast. Welcome to Sunspots, where we highlight the many ministries and missions happening on the surface of the sun, that is, the Senate of the Sun. A region of the Presbyterian Church USA, we are Presbyterians in Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas, with dynamic and hopeful ministry happening in the name of Jesus Christ. Our prayer is that you find inspiration, community, and connection in the sun. Welcome to this edition of Sunspots. Let's get started. Welcome. Um, today, I have Nanette Cagney with me. Um, Nanette is a commission pastor serving St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Welcome, Nanette. Hello, Valerie. It's good to be with you. Good to be with you, too. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Nanette, could you give us a little bit of background? Um, I know most commission pastors tend to be I'm not even sure second career is the right word, but um, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got there. Bivocational. Most of us uh, in other careers. Um, I am by training an attorney and I come from a military background. So we were traveling all over the place, but my junior year of college, I transferred to Loyola in New Orleans. I graduated with a degree in social work. And I worked in that field and decided I needed graduate school. So I looked at different options and applied to uh, Tulane for an MSW, an MBA, and a JD. And I ended up in JD. So I went to Tulane Law School, graduated from there, and I got hired by an oil company and they said, um, of all the places in the United States, the only place we won't send you to is Louisiana, which I thought was a little odd since I was trained in civil law. And then they, for whatever reason, had to change her heart and sent me to Louisiana. So I ended up in uh, Lake Charles. No, I ended up in Lafayette, Louisiana, and then I got a job in the federal courts eventually and transferred to Lake Charles. So I was senior staff attorney at the federal court while I took the commission pastor classes from Dubuque. I think I was in maybe the first class at Dubuque, long time ago. <laughs> and it was funny because my pastor then said, uh, you're exactly the type of person that we're looking for to be a commission pastor. And I said, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I said, the last thing I want to do is be a pastor. I am not nuts. Uh-uh. Uh and it was, I ended up there in a strange series of uh, events. I completed the course and, you know, I only took it because I wanted to understand Reformed theology. I was first licensed to preach in another denomination a long time ago, but it was very different from Presbyterian. And I'm the type of person I want to understand. If I'm going to get on board, I want to know what I'm getting on board with. And so I took the classes for my own edification. I had no no plans whatsoever. And I said that the first day of class when they said, oh, I want to be a pastor. I want to. And I said, you people are nuts. <laughs> Nobody volunteers to do that. Saying that out loud was your first mistake. Yeah. <laughs> so here I said, I've been at St. Andrew as their pastor now for 15 years as of the last weekend in January. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. So St. Andrews, uh, what is that like? St. Andrews, if I remember, because if I remember correctly from my years in Lake Charles, that is almost directly across the street from McNeese University. It is. Um, so what, what is your, what does your ministry look like? What's the mission of St. Andrews? St. Andrews was founded in 1959. It was a mission of First Presbyterian Church here. 
-hmm. And the demographics in our city were very different back then. Uh, Chenault was an Air Force base, and there was a need to have a campus on the south side of town. And so they bought land adjacent to McNeese. And the idea then was that it would draw military personnel from Chenault, and it would draw college students. Um, the military base has long since closed, but we have had an active college ministry at McNeese since, at least since I've been there. Um, it's been tried off and on throughout the years, but we had a pretty good relationship going with college. Now, COVID's kind of messed things up as far as that goes. You know, we can't do the gatherings we would do. I have not yet figured out how to do college ministry in a pandemic. And, you know, besides the pandemic, after the hurricanes, the campus had millions of dollars of damage. So the students haven't been there anyway. They're just beginning to come back. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. What so in 2020, there was a pandemic and there were three hurricanes to hit South Louisiana. How were, was Lake Charles affected by all three of those? Um, Lake Charles was pretty much destroyed by Laura, widespread damage. And then we had Beta, but Beta didn't do too much damage. And then Delta came in and the people who, for the most part, didn't have damage, that extensive damage from Laura got it from Delta. So we, we were down for the count. I mean, no community can sustain that kind of widespread damage. It's been, it's been tough. We kept telling ourselves, we just need to get through 2020. We just need to get through 2020. We get to 2021 and we get the polar vortex. It's not just Texas that got hit with that freeze. Oh, I know. I know. Every every presbytery in this synod was hit by or affected somehow by that um, by that snowstorm. So, so how are the people of St. Andrews doing? How is you know how has this affected or affected your ministry? And how is what's come out of it for you to this point? Ooh. Well, the damage to our campus um, is is beyond description. You know, we thought it was bad, and then we found out like the whole front wall of our sanctuary is detached from this roof, and it just keeps getting worse. But it's been good in that we have a real appreciation for what I think everybody took for granted before the pandemic. And, you know, we are a <laughs> frighteningly friendly congregation. <laughs> I've had some folks that were friends visit and you know, one couple I remember didn't come back. And when I saw them, I said, why not? And they just said, you people scared us because <laughs> we, we hugged and we talked and they just weren't used to that. <laughs> but so the pandemic's been really hard and everybody has been saying, we just want to get back together. And so with a hurricane, hurricanes, everybody's homes had damage. Um, some of our younger couples, I mean, totally lost everything. Mm. But uh, everybody is many are still working on their houses. And then we have the church issue, which all of our buildings were damaged. Um, thankfully, the administration building had the least amount of damage. So we've got our offices in there and we can work in that building. We've been trying to, when the weather's nice, worship in the yard because we have a nice asphalt pad back there and we can, it became really important to get together, even with our social distancing and our masks. And we wanted some semblance of the liturgy that we love. So we decided the best way to do that's in the yard because we could still sing and have responsive prayers. Mm -hmm. But it, it's been interesting because 
like at Christmas, I was trying to figure out how do you do Christmas in a pandemic with a destroyed church? And I heard from our youth at our church and they said, you know, we, we can't do this. We need to get together. And it was a real awakening call for me, you know, just to say, okay, the kids are saying we've got to get together. So we at least did some things like we gathered outside with candles to do Christmas carols because they said they couldn't imagine Christmas without our Christmas carols. Right. And, you know, we broadcast Christmas from the sanctuary on Zoom. That was before we realized it was unsafe to be in the sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So, so uh, because of the pandemic, you know, you and I were on a call um, a few weeks ago where you mentioned that um, your congregation has actually been serving the community in ways that they weren't doing before. What, what, tell me more about that. We've basically become a distribution hub for supplies for the hurricane, which has been wonderful working with groups like the Disaster Justice Network that Christina Peterson, one of our ministers down in um, southeast Louisiana, heads up. A lot of supplies have been coming through Lake Charles, and we've been working with other churches and community groups. We have, we have a diverse congregation. But we have always wanted um, a closer relationship, especially with some of the African-American churches on the north side of town. And this is the good side of all of this is that it's happening through the disaster in working to help rebuild the north side of town. We've gotten relationships that we truly value um, We've got a group of a coalition of African-American churches called, they go through um, Greater St. Mary Missionary Baptist Church. We have some community organizers. Um, last week, an 18-wheeler arrived at the church full of supplies. It was a bit of a frustrating time because they had been told that we didn't have a loading dock or a forklift and they needed to come prepared and they came with a truck without an automatic lift gate and no forklift and it had 25 pallets and uh so we put out the call to our community partners and it was so funny because um next thing we know there's a forklift driving down the street from don's car wash to help us unload the truck We've got um, Water's Edge Homeless Ministry there. We've got community organizers for Healthy Golf there. We've got representatives from Greater St. Mary there. We've got everybody showing up to help unload the pallets. So it ended up going from six in the morning to six at night, but everything got unloaded. Everything got distributed in one day. It was out. It was on the streets. Wow. It was to the people who needed it. Wow. So. And there's no way we, we could have done that, just St. Andrew. I mean, it was everybody. And that's something that we've seen as a result of this hurricane. It's, um, you know, SBA, FEMA, or the Red Cross have pretty much been missing in action. We have found as a community that we have more than ever got, we've got to bind together to get things done. And we've seen a really positive side of our community from all of this. Everybody's working together. People get on the Hurricane um, Facebook page and say, I'm out of baby formula. What do I do? And next thing you look down and 20 people have said, what kind do you need and where can we deliver it? Wow. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So what, what are the remaining needs? I mean, those of us who who live in places that don't um, that aren't susceptible to hurricanes, um, I'm not sure we have an understanding of what it takes to recover from one. Ooh. So, I mean, that was last year. What are the remaining needs now? Well, we're you know, it seems like last year. If you look at one, we're only six months out from a major right. disaster. Well, yeah, right. Okay. Because we're all, I'm, my brain, I guess, is still, you know, we just need to get past 2020 and everything will be. I know. Yeah, six months ago. Wow. Well, and 
to think, you know, we're a community, the city itself is maybe about 80,000. And I would say at least 90% of the structures, if not more, were damaged. So, you know, you have your basic scramble of everybody trying to get the roofs fixed first. Mm -hmm. And there's only so many roofing contractors. You know, some people are still waiting for their roofs. Wow. But, um, you know, this is a perfect storm between COVID, the closing of restaurants, the service industry, um, the economic impact of that put together with the hurricanes of, of restaurants and stores that couldn't reopen even if the pandemic were gone because now they're all damaged and their inventory has been destroyed. So we have um, an increasing number of homeless and displaced people. Um, many of our population are still living in hotels in Texas. It's just... It's hard to describe, you know, we've been, uh, one of the things we've been receiving and distributing from the Disaster Justice Network is tents because people are living in tents in their yards or tents in the woods. Um, and living in tents through the snowmageddon, the, through the, you guys receive mostly ice, I think, but through those terribly cold temperatures. We tried. And the community, again, mobilized, especially the faith-based groups in the week prior to the freeze. And through the grace of God, I think we got almost everybody out of tents and out of the woods and streets into hotel rooms, which, which was a challenge in and of itself, not just financially, but half of our hotels are destroyed. And so the hotel rooms... Um, were filled with contractors and insurance people. So if you could find a hotel room, the surcharges they added um, mm. were astronomical. And here we were scrambling, trying to get all these folks off the street. But we did it and nobody died from exposure, which uh, was the goal. Right. I mean, it was the goal. So, I think right now the need is for volunteers. And I know that's hard because, you know, PDA and MCOR and all these groups that usually send volunteers aren't doing it because of the pandemic. Um, so all the volunteer energy that we would normally have here, we don't have. Uh, the group that has been so faithful in coming are the Mennonites. Um, they've been coming down from as far as Ohio to help with groups of volunteers. So we have ways to house them and the groups that we have, we appreciate. And the other thing, you know, it, it comes to supplies and finances. Even if we have the volunteers, you need the drywall and the sheetrock and those things to be able to do the work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And we're in the rebuilding phase. So um, that's the type of things I think that are needed right now is either finances for building supplies or building supplies. Mm -hmm. You know, the frightening thing about the, the freeze was that, is that on the north side of town, so many of the houses are damaged and it's a lower socioeconomic group, uh, maybe not much insurance coverage. And windows are missing doors are missing and when i spoke to city officials prior to the storm i said you know they've got a roof but they have no heating source and they have no windows and the cold's coming right through and the you know they said well they've got a roof and i thought <laughs> you know, no there's something you know and i've struggled with that since then because Yes, they have a roof, and that does put them in a much better position than so many other people, the ones in the tents. But it's nowhere near enough. I mean, you know, and so we are past the freeze. Hopefully we don't have another one. But so now we're going to go to our 100-degree summers. Right. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a bad situation. I think, realistically, it'll take 
10, 20 years for this community to recover. Hmm. So, so what, what can people who are listening and learning about the situation in Lake Charles, what, what can we do? What can, what can people do in response to the need? Send us volunteer groups. <laughs> I know, I know with COVID, you know, there's, there's a question about there, but you can still work safely and we still have safe places to put people, albeit smaller groups. We do need volunteer teams. Mm -hmm. And again, if there's a way, if you have the resources or the ability to gather building supplies, um, that's the thing that we need, whether it be nails or, you know, sheetrock mud or whatever. Um, because as I said before, even if we have the volunteers, if we don't have the materials to rebuild. And the contractors, you don't, you don't have the contractors right now either, right? Well, we have tons of contractors that descended on us, but then you have the scammers mixed in. Right, right. And, and the need far exceeds the number of available contractors. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, it's just too extensive. Wow. Okay. So we will put the call out for volunteer work groups and for supplies. And we'll, we'll do everything we can to help get the message out about that. I hope you've been enjoying this episode of Sunspots. Most of us, especially in these times, need to hear more about the work of the Spirit. Places where the energy has caused a solar flare and made big impact. It could be in your local congregation, presbytery, or any ministry context. Send that good news and ministry ideas to the Synod at sunspots at synodsun.org. Now, back to the show. One of the other things we wanted to talk, I wanted to talk to you about today um, is the Empowering Commission Pastors Network. You know, pre-pandemic, um, there was quite a movement among um, this network in the Senate of the Sun to um, provide a conference, the Empowering Commission Pastors Conference. And we, there was a lot of press about this and there were over 350 people registered for this event um, that was going to provide opportunities to, um, for um, commission pastors, those who are already commissioned, those who um, are I'm considering a call as a commission pastor to come and be, you know, educated and connect and learn about the different situations, um, what it means to be a commission pastor in different presbyteries, all the different locations in the country. Um, and uh, we were excited. And then the pandemic hit and all of that had to be canceled. I, I'm interested to hear from you about what, what do you, what do you think are the um, unique challenges of commission pastors that that specific event was set up to address? Hmm. Well, I think there's a growing number of um, commission pastors in the PCUSA. And there was a huge need for networking. We needed to get to know each other. We needed to familiarize ourselves with each other's ministries and seeing how people were doing what they were doing. Um, I tell you, we planned for, I think, two years before, and we were supposed to have the conference in May. So... It was such a disappointment, but even those of us who were on the Empowering Commission Pastor Steering Committee formed such a strong bond, you know, to be able to pick up the phone and talk to each other, to support each other. I think the way uh, the PCA, PCUSA has been historically, um, like GA, they are built for supporting teaching elders in their ministry. So this new 
thing or semi new thing of commissioned pastors, we're somewhere out there in a gap. And there's a huge need for support with a growing number. As you said, you know, 350 signed up for this, co this conference. But now these weren't all from the Senate of the Sun because it quickly morphed into a national thing mm -hmm. because the need is so great. And we had so many workshops planned and worship planned and, you know, it's just. <laughs> and con yeah. And conversations among and, and with mid council leaders that um, I'm, I was really excited about um, because it had the potential to bring to the surface sort of the, um, the, some of the disparities that if, yeah. If as a commission pastor, if you only serve, if you're only in one presbytery, you, you see and understand how that system works, but you often don't see and understand how it might be working in a different place. And, um, and there, there really are disparities there that you can't recognize from within your own system. And I was really excited about those conversations that might help some of those things bubble up and really make the, um, the larger church take notice and maybe be able to address some of those things. I was, uh, I'm very fortunate in that the Presbytery of South Louisiana, there's been nothing but support. It's a, a totally supportive Presbytery and there's a mutual respect between teaching elders and commissioned pastors. And I found in some of the national meetings that I've been in that that's probably the exception, not the rule. And um, I think it would be so frustrating. It's hard enough to do the job we're doing, but it would be so frustrating to be in a presbytery where the support wasn't there because the need for the commission pastors are there as our um, congregations are getting smaller. You know, so many of them are not able to even meet the minimum package for the teaching elders and most of the commission pastors are bivocational. Um, they're either, some are retired, some are still working. Um, like I still worked at the federal court for 10 years of the time I was being a pastor at St. Andrew. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I had two full-time jobs. They tell me the job at the church is part-time, but I don't think there's such a thing as a part-time pastor. <laughs> I'm not convinced. Right. <laughs> there's part-time pay. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there, there are challenge, institutional challenges there. Um, you know, some people who have been exposed for a prolonged period to the ministry of commissioned elders or commissioned pastors really um, validate that ministry and value that ministry. Those who haven't been, who are from the more traditional church where there's been an abundance of teaching elders, they're not real sure about these people and what they're doing. And um, there's developed whether or not it's been intentional, this second class or maybe even third class of ministers, which are the commissioned pastors. And we feel that acutely, whether people want to talk about it and acknowledge it or not, it exists. Mm -hmm. And we're very aware of it. So part of the point of the commission pastors conference was to um, not just bring that to light, but give our commission pastors broad scale validation and say, you know, the church needs you and values what you're doing. These small congregations you know, we don't want to just go around. Some people say, well, you know, they're small, they can't afford a teaching elder, they should just be closed. Well, we'd lose, you know, five, six of the PCUSA if we just went around closing churches that got under 50 members. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a challenge. It really is a challenge. So um, 
in light of all that, I mean, I know you've been dealing with hurricanes and we've all been dealing with pandemics and, and all of that since um, the conference wasn't able to happen. Are there, um, are there plans for the future? What has the network um, been up to, thought about? What's, what's the direction? We haven't given up. Um, That's good. We, That's important to note. <laughs> we would still, we still hope, at, at least synod-wide, if not further, that when we can gather, we do gather, whether it's the full conference or something smaller. A couple months ago, we offered a worship on Zoom that was a Taze worship that was led by Sharon Curry, and it was beautiful. It was really beautiful. Um, we have some other workshops planned. We're not going to necessarily do them on our, um, a regular basis. People will just have to kind of keep their eyes open. Um, but we're still going to offer some workshops until we can get to that point that we can meet together. I know after we started planning this, um, one of the synods on the East Coast was already in contact with us saying, okay, we're going to do the follow-up conference. <laughs> I don't know if the follow-up conference will come first or we will. But yeah, yeah, we should probably get a hold of that person. Um, yeah, it, the thing that I really appreciated about the way the conference was put together and, and even the way that um, the network has um, you know, moved beyond that is the way that it truly is commission power, commission pastors empowering commission pastors. So yeah. you don't, um, you don't always look first to the teaching elders to lead workshops because there are, you know, gifted and skilled commission pastors, um, who are capable of, um, uh, uh, teaching and working with um, other commission pastors. And I've really appreciated that, um, that, that it's allowing those people an opportunity to share their gifts with others. We, we did look for commission pastors to lead most of the workshops. And um, one of the other things we were going to do, too, is just have a discussion about the different ways commission pastors are being used in different synods and presbyteries. They're not all just small church pastors, mm -hmm. you know, are doing pastoral care. Some are working in hospitals. There's different um, ways that the commission pastors are being utilized and that was one of the things we were going to talk about to say, you know, here's, here's ways that we can um, benefit the presbyteries in different ways. Mm -hmm. But we needed to hear it ourselves before we could go back to our presbyteries and say, hey, did you know this presbytery is using them this way? <laughs> right. Right. So we were looking forward to all of that. I know personally, I was looking forward most to the worship. Um, you know, we are all leading worship for the most part on a continuous basis. So to be able to sit in worship with other commission pastors, and we had it broken down into we were going to have a traditional worship, blended worship, contemporary worship, Taze worship, you know, we were going to mm -hmm. do that to expose people to different ways things could be done and different kinds of music. We were really looking forward to that. Maybe one day. Yeah, yeah. and maybe one day when um, the uh, Commission Pastors Network begins its own podcast, you can begin having conversations with um, commission pastors who are being, who are serving the church in different ways those could be really good, really good um, generative conversations. I would love, I would love to hear that. It could be. <laughs> um, so I, 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 this is one of the questions that I ask all of our podcast guests that, and it's my own, sort of my own personal want to hear what are the ways that you believe that the Holy Spirit has redirected you? 
now I will say first, you know, I mean, there's a couple of different ways you could look at this question just based on this conversation, right? Um, Holy Spirit redirection from the pandemic, from the perspective of your church and hurricanes and, and all of those things, but also from the perspective of um, the uh, Commission Pastors Network and you know, we're, we've all been redirected because of the pandemic. What are some, some things we've learned, some, some things that people might consider failures or opportunities for redirection that the Spirit has provided in this time? Well, first of all, with the pandemic, I think the redirection, if, it's, if we can put it that way, is um, a new or um, an increased awareness of how much we mean to each other. Um, to be able to sit next to each other, to hear the word together, to praise, to hug, to fellowship together. I think we were doing it so much, we were taking it for granted. Mm. And that we've gone over a year without it, that's the thing we long for the most. Yeah. You know, so whether whether it's sitting in the yard six feet apart, just so we can be in the same space. I don't know that we're going to take it for granted when this is over. I think we're going to value what we have so much more than we did before. That's that's one of the key things, I think. Um, uh, another thing is many of us were terrified of technology and we got thrown in over our heads really quickly and we had to adapt. And at the beginning of all this, there wasn't very much support out there. It was sink or swim, figure out how to do this or your church won't be worshiping. And um, so it stretched us. <laughs> yeah, and we're immediately when this, when the pandemic, when the lockdown first started, well, that was one of the first things that we as a synod did for the admission uh, the commission pastors network. Yes. Right. Was yes. off the, the online worship, um, workshop. Yeah. Or totally did a wonderful workshop for us and, you know, the do's and don'ts when you're on camera and, you know, some really basic practical things came out of that workshop. And a lot of us looked at that, watched that, although I think we were, our eyes were crossed and rolled back in our heads. <laughs> it's probably true. Right. You know, and I think this is a lasting change. There are many of us, uh, for us, as an example, I can't see that there we're going to go forward without an online component. Even when we gather in worship for those who are, you know, not feeling well or who are older and can't get out of their homes, they're all used to being on Zoom now. We're going to have an online component. It's not going away when we can open the doors again. Right. You know, and another thing for us out of all of this is we were knocked down pretty far down with all the destruction and all the challenges that came from the past hurricane season. And we realized more than ever how important mission was for us. We could have easily turned inward and said, just licked our wounds and said, you know, we've been knocked down, y'all. You, you come help us. We're, you know, right, we're, right. and we talked about it and, you know, we came to the realization that mission was more important than ever because we could not become an, um, an inward focused church. We felt like if we did that, we would die. That would be the death knell. We needed to continue to reach out and support our community however we could and the support of other Presbyterian churches has been phenomenal. Um, right after the storm, we got an abundance of gift cards like to Home Depot. Um, and it, it strikes me, one of the churches who was most supportive of us is a church over in Florida that had been wiped out from Hurricane Michael two years before. Mm. Their pastor called me and reached out to me and her congregation sent gift cards. We got gift cards from a little church in South Carolina, but we could give those to our members, which was a lesson in and of itself, because these folks are used to giving receiving is a whole nother thing. Yeah. And, you know, 
the person who's in charge of mission right now for our church said, you know, it's really hard to consider that sometimes in this process, we are the mission and we need to learn to do that. And that was another growth um, time for us. Mm -hmm. But um, so we were able to share those gift cards with our congregation for repairs of their homes because everybody needed it. And we were able to share them with the community as well. So the support of the other churches has been phenomenal. You know, again, sometimes we take it for granted that we're a connectional church. And, you know, we're, we're not happy when it comes time to pay our annual um, dues, <laughs> our assessments. Our per capita, our, all of those things, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, that's part of being the connectional church. We're in a denomination, and there are um, needs of the whole, and there are needs of the individual members of the whole, and we've seen all of that in this process. Hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of upsides of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't like being the mission. <laughs> but, <laughs> But like you said, there, there, there are good lessons in all of that. Yeah. Um, so as a um, we talked about, you know, the needs of the community now, um, as you continue to recover from hurricanes and snowstorms and, and those things, um, by the way, if you're able send volunteer, um, work groups and um, supplies. Um, but as it relates to the commission pastors networks or network, what is, what is that ministry's greatest challenge right now? I think the greatest challenge is we need to be able to get together. Yeah. Just I mean, everything you know, last, last month uh, or a couple of weeks ago, the steering team got back together on Zoom for the first time in a few months. And it wasn't with an agenda. It was just because we needed to get together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's hard when you work together and you build relationships and all of a sudden the world's turned upside down and you can't do that anymore. We, we need to not lose our momentum. It's hard to keep it in the midst of all of this. Mm -hmm. um, but the need hasn't gone away. In yeah, fact, absolutely. probably, fact is probably when we bigger get, now, right? Well, yeah. When we can get together, the need will be even greater. And we'll have war stories about how we survived the pandemic and the hurricane and the ice storm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As a result of the ice storm or the freezing temperatures, you know, we, we like other folks in Texas, didn't have water for a while, but it was a hurricane problem because so many of the structures in our town were have been vacated because of damage that they didn't know all the pipes were burst inside those structures. They had to bring in the National Guard to try to locate water pouring out of abandoned houses so they could turn them off at the street. Oh. It's it's continuing hurricane problem <laughs> oh no so okay well um we you've already issued a call to action for the hurricane recovery um send work groups um send supplies um um what are there is there anything else you would you would want people to do as a result of hearing about the damage um, and the challenges in South Louisiana, or even about the Commission Pastors Network and how, how they can be involved in that? Well, as far, far as damage in, in our community, we still put your prayers. I mean, that, that we still need very much on all fronts. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, just watch, the Presbytery of South Louisiana has a publication called the 1020 that's put on their website and um, the Senate of the Sun has various publications. Just keep an eye out on those because when we become aware of specific needs in the community, we're posting them. Okay. That's the only way we know to get the work. Um, so we're doing that. And with the commission pastors, I'd say if you're um, a commission pastor and you became one, especially after all this happened, or you're not a part of the network, 
contact the synod to get on the commission pastors list so that when we crank back up or we offer these workshops, um, you'll know about them and you'll be able to participate in them. Super. Well, thank so. you. Annette. Thank you so much for being with us and taking time out of your day. Very busy, I'm sure, recovery day. Um, I appreciate you sharing stories of St. Andrew Presbyterian Church in Lake Charles, as well as um, about the Commission Pastor Network. Well, thank you, Valerie, and we appreciate all the work you're doing. In the Senate of the Sun, we believe when we work together across boundaries, we make visible the good news and find wholeness as the body of Christ. In our common calling, we impact lives together. So let's remember to connect with, equip, and empower one another in the name of Jesus Christ, today and every day.